This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 5 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was published in Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. I've been publishing extracts from the Wardsman in the Westford Eagle since January 2008 in the weekly Museum Musings column. In this episode, we'll be reading the Westford Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, February 1st, 1908, and I will add comments as appropriate to more fully explain what was happening in Westford 113 years ago. So the first uh, part of the newspaper for February 1st is the About Town section. Tuesday afternoon, several cars loaded with stone on the tracks of the H.E. Fletcher & Company were derailed while going to Brookside. The tracks were badly torn up and the stone scattered without any regard to ownership. Uh, I should explain that in 1895, the Fletcher Quarry Company installed a standard gauge railroad spur running from the Stony Brook or the Boston and Maine, as uh, it's more uh, familiarly uh, known. From that railroad, just east of the Brookside Station, north across Brookside Road and Groton Road into the quarry uh, to facilitate the transportation of the quarried granite uh, to their customers via the B&M Railroad. Uh, Back to the wardsman. The annual appraisal of property at the town farm will be held this Saturday, and the annual dinner on such occasions will be appraised by the usual town officers who have been preparing their judgment for a week. We'll talk more about this this one next week. Last Monday, last Monday morning, the electric car at Brookside was allowed to run off the rails at the terminal of the tracks, damaging the car and dislocating the paint on the yard fence of George W. Bussey. At the meeting of the Republican Town Committee held at the Selectman's Room Monday evening for the purpose of organizing for the year, the Honorable H. E. Fletcher was elected chairman, Alfred W. Hartford secretary, and Julian A. Cameron treasurer. The chairman has served as such many years before, and it is fitting that in a year of presidential campaign work, a man of experience who has the tact of skillful planning and successful execution should be unanimously selected to fill again after a lapse of two years the position which he so efficiently held in the happy years of the past. The dispensing of knowledge in the Parkerville School has been temporarily suspended pending the outcome of the right-of-way of measles. Uh, Apparently there was a measles epidemic in Parkerville. Daniel May, M-A-Y, who resides on Oak Hill while out Mayflowering, evidently gathered something which could not be classified as belonging to May. The court at Ayr, holding the same opinion, ordered May to winter at the jail until his power of discernment was sufficiently developed to enable him to rightfully classify only that which belongs to May. Uh, This was written by Samuel Taylor, and and he he liked puns. (laughs) That was a pun on the surname May. William A. Whitney and George A. Crawford have moved from Lowell to Westford to the residence of Sidney D. Whitney on the Lowell Road. At present, they are climbers on behalf of the town for the Brown Tail Moth Fund. Uh, The town actually did have a fund uh, for combating the infestation of the Brown Tail Moth and a little later the Gypsy Moth. The brown tail moth made uh, nests high up in trees, and the, they hired men to climb up in the trees and bring out the, mess, n- the nests and burn them. Elmer Houghton, Houghton, more familiarly known as Sandy, has resigned his position as motorman on the westward line of the electric road, where he had a real genuine Sandy familiar, familiarity and welcome. He has decided to feed the hungry and otherwise contribute comforts for cash at a boarding house in North Chelmsford. His home has been in air for many years, and he was formerly fireman on the Stony Brook Freight. His household apparatus passed through town last week Friday for North Chelmsford, a large lunch cart being conspicuous in the procession. 
The next Farmers Institute will be held at Dracut Wednesday, February 5th. The program is not yet announced. Uh, you might recall that uh, in one of the previous podcasts, we talked about the January Farmers Institute that was held at Westford Town Hall. The next meeting of Westford Grange will be held Thursday evening, February 6th, when the state chaplain, A. H. Wheelock of Marlboro, will address the Grange on the influence of the Grange in the community. And more about that next week also. Just as was foretold, the axe of the woodman is busy these days cutting down the beauty of the forests on the Davis lot near Cold Spring. The new water system of the Westford Water Company has developed into utility, and last week Friday, the iron pipes and hydrants performed the service for which they were laid, and all Westford rejoices that the pure and abundant water of the sand beds of Pine Ridge Valley shall no longer perform only a negative service in the world, but contrary to its natural tendency, by the application of a steam harness, it finds no difficulty in scaling the heights of Westford, where for centuries before it was not even on visiting terms. Thanks for the Westford Water Company for their generous courtesy in bringing about this mutual introduction of the people to the water and the water to the people. The engine at the pumping station got into such a high fever over what had happened that an overheated bearing made it necessary to temporarily stop and take a few mechanical stitches. This is a, in reference to the newly installed water system in Westford Center uh, that was fed by uh, wells that were uh, off of Plain Road, I believe somewhere in that area anyway, and the water was pumped to the water tower on top of Prospect Hill in uh, Westford Center. The opinion was expressed at the last special town meeting that it was unfair to tax the whole town for what only those in the range of this water supply would derive benefit from. But upon investigating the subject, it will be found that the injustice is of small magnitude. For it is safe to say that at least three-fourths of the wealth is located in this water district, that is in Westford Center, and that of the annual appropriation of $1,600 by the town for hydrant service, the water district will have to pay $1,200. Nor is this all of the equity. Besides contributing this tax to the town, they will have to pay a special tax for the use of the water. Nor is this all. If equity prevails to its limit, a rise in the valuation of this property will come close to laying the whole burden, public and private, of this water system onto those who are, repay, who, who are reaping where they have sown. But even this may not dispel the thought of the taxpayers on the outskirts that they are contributing a, quote, widow's might, end quote. Uh, that's, of course, a, a reference to... Jesus' parable about the widow's might that you can read about in Mark chapter 12, verse 42, or Luke chapter 21, verse 2. Again, Samuel uh, Taylor liked to uh, quote things like that from the Bible. The next section is the Westford Center section. What might have been a serious fire was averted Monday. People in the vicinity of the house at 36 Main Street next to the post office which was at the Wright and Fletcher store at 40 Main Street, smelled smoke during the afternoon, and upon investigation, a soot fire, S-O-O-T, in one of the chimneys was found actively smoldering, and if it had not been discovered when it was, serious results would have followed. A number of buckets of soot were taken. The house were taken out. The house is owned by A.J. Abbott and occupied by a Mr. LeDuc and family. A high wind was blowing, and Wright and Fletcher, whose store is so near, feel thankful that it was discovered when it was. Mrs. George T. Day is confined to the house with a severe cold. Miss Emily Fletcher is able to be out once more after the same experience. Miss R. W. Littledale of California is the guest of Miss Clara Fisher, and the two friends are much enjoying recalling former associations together in the Golden Gate County country. Miss Littledale, Miss Littledale expresses charming enthusiasm with an experience of a New England winner. 
Charles Roby is confined to his home with pneumonia. Mr. Baker and family have moved into the cottage on Main Street owned by Alec Fisher. He was formerly at the O.A. Foster Farm. The next section is the uh, Tadmuk Club report. A large number of members and guests were present Tuesday afternoon at Library Hall for the regular meeting. Including, included in this number were all of the teachers of the schools in the village, that is Westford Center. General quotations in response to the roll call were well sustained, many very appropriately bearing in mind the subject of the afternoon and choosing their responses. This subject was, quote, the new era in child life, end quote, and the members felt very grateful, I'm sorry, and the members felt very grateful to the three gentlemen who so ably carried out the afternoon's program. Reverend C.P. Marshall of the Union Congregational Church in Westford Center gave a good outline of the child labor problem in mills, mines, and sweatshops and what is being done for good in this worthy cause. C.O. Prescott, with a long record of success as a teacher, gave a scholarly paper on industrial education and preceptor of Westford Academy, William A. Perkins, interested all who heard him with a bright, comprehensive talk on physical development. The next meeting, February 11th, will be in charge of the Domestic Science Committee, and Mrs. H. V. Hildreth will be the speaker of the afternoon on sanitation. Miss Eva Fletcher will supply current events. The next section is the Graniteville section. The scarlet fever has broken out here once more, and again the tag is tacked on the house of Henry Provost, the well-known barber. A short time ago, the youngest daughter, Gertrude, was ill with the fever. In fact, the house was fumigated only a few days ago, and now the eldest daughter, Miss Mary, is down with a troublesome disease. Mr. Provost is boarding out and conducting his business in a shop near J.A. Healy's livery stable. I think that was on Broadway Street in uh, Graniteville, but I'm not sure about that. The LAS, that is the Ladies' Aid Society, of the ME, that is Methodist Episcopal Church, held a supper and entertainment in the vestry on Friday evening of last week that was very largely attended and proved to be a great social and financial success. An excellent supper was served from 6.30 to 8 o'clock, and a capable committee composed of Mrs. C.G. Sargent, Mrs. H.N. Fletcher, Mrs. J.E. Woods, and Mrs. W.H. Beebe attended to the wants of the many who sat down at the well-filled tables. Immediately after the supper, a short but very pleasing program of vocal music was given under the direction of Mrs. Sidney Wright, assisted by members from Westford Grange. The program was as follows. Song, Don't You Cry, My Honey, Male Quartet. Song, I'll Take You Back Again, Kathleen, John Grieg, song, uh, the, John Grieg sang it. Song, In the Gloaming, sung by Edson G. Boynton. Song, uh, That's All, by the Male Quartet. Mrs. C.H. Wright served on the reception and general committee the Ladies' Aid extends its thanks to all those who helped in any way toward this affair. Special mention being made of W.H. Beebe for his kind assistance in this and many similar affairs for which the society is very grateful. I believe he was the custodian at the Methodist Church at the time. A neat sum was realized on the supper and entertainment. A very enjoyable house party was held at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Gagnon on Saturday evening last that was largely attended by the village people. Several invited guests were present from out of town. Among them, Miss Anna Bergen and Master Owen Bergen of East Pepperell, Mrs. Eva and Anna Barreau Bar and Arthur Barreau of Lowell, Miss Ora Gagnon of Chelmsford Center, George Stanley, Joseph McTeague, and Walter Godet of North Chelmsford, and Harvey Godet of Pawtucketville. 
The evening was spent in playing games and other forms of amusement. A pleasing incident in connection with the affair was the presentation of a gold watch chain to Jerry Gagnon as a surprise from his many friends, the presentation speech being made by his daughter, Miss Eva Gagnon. Mr. Gagnon responded in an agreeable manner. A bountiful luncheon was served during the evening after which the following pleasing program was given. Piano solo, Eva Gagnon, duet, uh, the, song, the song Experience by Eva and Daisy Gagnon, piano duet by Anna and Eva Barrow, violin solo by Jerry Gagnon, song Kiss Me Once More Goodnight by Laura Roy and John Landry of Lowell, song Neath the Old Acorn Tree by the Graniteville Quartet, recitation You and I, Catherine Rafferty, Violin solo by Anne Barrow, song Waiting Home for Me, Waiting at Home for Me by Jerry Tebow of Lowell, song Bye Bye Deary by Frank Loftus, song Top of the Morning by Bob Parker of Lowell, duet Every Little Bit Helps by Michael and Thomas Rafferty, song Take Me Back to New York Town by Cora Gagnon, song I Would If I Could by Mr. and Mrs. Albert Reeves, piano duet. Oh, uh, piano duet, Laura Roy and Eva Gagnon. Recitation, Our Country Home, Florence Sullivan. And finally, a song, Will You Forgive, Will you forgive If I Forget, by Frank Charlton. The party broke up at a seasonable hour after all had spent a very enjoyable evening. This is kind of typical of a lot of parties that are reported in the wardsman uh, that happened many years ago. A, a party in honor of somebody for a birthday or an anniversary with uh, some kind of gift and entertainment by local people. Next we come to the Forge Village section. Fire broke out near the chimney of Mr. Sweat's house last week Friday, but for the prompt assistance of neighbors it might have been very serious. Alan Karkin of Gardner made a short call upon his parents, Mr. and Mrs. A.W. Karkin, last Sunday, having just recovered from an attack of grip. As we've mentioned before, that's influenza. And finally, Frank Collins, son of Superintendent Collins of the Abbott Worsted Mills, has accepted the position of draftsman at the Massachusetts Mohair Plush Company's works in Lowell. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending February 1st, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions from the Westford Wardsman at the Westford Historical Society's website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Alphen, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.